Are you planning a trip or a family holiday with your little ones this year? Are you worried that things might be different where you're going, that they're not going to be in their usual sleep environment and that the day-to-day -day routine is going to be different? And does it concern you that you want to be able to do fun things and take days out and enjoy your family time away without feeling totally tied to a little one's routine, but at the same time without completely breaking them in terms of their sleep? Well, rest assured we have got you covered because in today's episode, we're going to be talking all about travel, family trips, holidays, vacations, whether that's in the same country or overseas, we have you covered, so stay tuned. Before we dive in, if you like my videos or podcasts, do me a favor and subscribe, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on Apple Podcasts. When you do that, we get to reach more parents like you and help more families. So hit subscribe and let's get stuck in with these top tips for traveling with young ones. Okay, so taking a family trip, a holiday, a vacation away with little ones can bring about some disruption to routine and it can also be a challenge with their sleep. So let's break this down and take you through everything from the journey, the destination and the return. So we're going to break this into three sections, starting off with the journey. When you head off on your trip, whether you're going by road, rail, plane, it doesn't matter. The core principles are the same and that is on that journey, you're going to need to take care of a few key things. One of them is going to be entertainment. Whether we're taking um, a baby or a young child away, they're going to need some form of entertainment. So what could that look like? Well, think about your mode of transport and what would be suitable. So for instance, there are things that you can do with your child if you're a passenger sitting next to them on an aeroplane that you can't do with your child if you're driving a car. So you've got to consider what it's going to be. Is it something they can do themselves or is it something that you need to assist with? So if they're going to have some screen time, then have a think about when that's most appropriate. When do you need to pull that one out of the bag most? Let's face it, as parents, sometimes that can be a useful secret weapon when we just need to figure something out or we're driving or we just need to appease them for a little while. So when would that be suitable? And therefore you can then try to avoid it being all the time. So they're not just glued to a screen for the entire journey. And also try and avoid that screen time right when you want them to go to sleep because it will wire them and it will stop them falling asleep. So what kinds of entertainment can you give your little ones? Okay, some suggestions for you. If they're old enough for audiobooks, those are amazing because you can put them on in the car or you can give them headphones and let them listen to that on any form of transport. If you have a few children, they can also listen to their own ones on their headphones. So audiobooks are great and of course, they can also fall asleep to them. So if they're listening to one, they're more likely to nod off than they would if they were fixed on the screen. If they're not old enough yet for audiobooks, then they may just enjoy some music. You can put some of their favorite tunes into a playlist. And again, whether you play that to the whole car or whether they're on a plane and you're going to put that on headphones, music can be helpful. But really little ones, you know, babies and toddlers, they probably wouldn't sit still for more than one song and they're gonna need more physical forms of entertainment. So I recommend small, unbreakable, light toys and I like to use the idea of pocket money toys. They're little bits and bobs, the kind of things you put in party bags, sort of throwaway toys really. They're not too precious. If they get lost, it's not that big of a deal. And it's great because you can actually purchase a few new ones. And with little ones, if a brand new thing that they haven't seen before comes out of a bag, then it will captivate their attention for a little while, as opposed to a toy that they see every day. So I highly recommend ahead of your trip that you slowly start to accumulate a few new little things, little toys, a variety that you can then pull out of the bag to grab their attention for a little while on your journey. It's a little like a holiday swag bag of new things. And don't let them just delve into that bag and look at them all at once. Space it out so that you can pull out a new thing at various intervals when they're fractious or when they need it. Okay, so let's now move on from entertainment to food. 
when you're on the journey, they're probably going to be hungry, unless the journey is very, very short. <laughs> so you need to think about this. And if you're going on the road, um, are you going to factor in stops for food or feeding your baby? If you're flying, are you taking things with you? Have you arranged with the airline for meals? Are you gonna have onboard meals? And we all know that fussy little children often don't want what's given to them. So no matter what mode of transport you're on, I would highly recommend having some handy snacks that will travel well. So like dry snacks are always a good one. Just to have in your bag, you never know when you're going to be stuck in a delay situation, whether that's at an airport or a traffic jam or whatever it may be, and you have no access to any food. So just imagine that worst case scenario, you're stuck, you've got nothing, and your little one is hungry, have you got a backup plan? And I would say that that would count right through childhood. So even the school aged children, just having something as a backup if they're hungry is a great idea. Picnics are good if you can carry food with you. Um, that's a great idea too. And if you're not breastfeeding, make sure that you've then got enough formula um, because if supplies are low, or you, you know, or if you can't get any, in, imagine like take a little more than you think you might need just in case because if you are delayed and if you can't access your baggage where the rest of it is um it's best to have a little more than you would need and the other thing to think about with the journey is their sleep now don't worry if they don't sleep at the exact times that they would normally sleep when we travel by whatever mode of transport there's always that sense of motion and white noise and it can be very lulling and can make us feel sleepy. I'm sure you felt that way yourself, I know I have. So they might nod off when they wouldn't normally. And that's a sign that they're tired and could use the sleep. They won't nod off if they're full of energy. So if they do nod off due to motion, they obviously need a bit of sleep. Let them have it, it's fine. Because there's also a good chance that they won't be able to sleep when they normally would. So let them clock those hours, let them take it when they want to take it, basically. The journey or the travel day is usually a little bit up in the air anyway in terms of routine. So whether your journey is just a few hours or the most part of the whole day, you'll likely find um, that it's gonna skew your routine for that one day. Uh, everything's going to be a little off track, but once you get to a destination, you can get things straight. So don't try to control the day too much when it's your travel day. Okay, so we're going to move on next to the destination. But before we do, I just wanted to ask you if you are enjoying this and if you like this video, you're finding it helpful, do me a favor and like it. Share it with a friend who might find this helpful too. Okay, so back to number two, the destination. When you arrive at your destination, you need to set up the environment. So that sleep environment is gonna be, it's gonna be different to at home, obviously. So now your little one might normally have their own room at home, but on the trip, they have to share with you, for instance. So the environment, no matter what, is gonna be new and different for your little one. This is why bringing something or a couple of comforts from home is gonna help, whether that's a pillowcase or a cuddly toy or a muzzy, or even something that just smells familiar from home, it can really help them to adjust and feel safe in that new environment. So if you have a baby and they're in a crib, bring the crib sheet and put that sheet straight from their bed at home onto their bed in your accommodation. It can really, really help. Another thing to consider is the light. If you have a room that's not set up for little one's sleep, you might need to take a travel blackout blind and stick that up and make sure it's nice and dark when it's sleep time. Make sure they're comfortable, of course, make sure they're safe, not too hot, not too cold. So if you're traveling into a warmer climate, you may need to make sure that there's air conditioning or have a little travel fan, that could be really helpful. Do they usually have white noise at home? Is it something that you can take with you? So just consider the environment you're going into and how you can best set that to ensure it's suitable for their sleep in the same way that it is at home. The routine is the next thing to think about when you get to your destination. So if you're changing time zones, when you arrive at your destination, you want to move immediately onto the new time zone. Now that might feel weird with jet lag. You might feel like, oh, but it feels to me like it's time to sleep or, you know, don't try to consider what time you were in. Like, you know, you're going, oh, but my body thinks it's this time. And I just get your mindset into the new time zone, local time, 
right away. It's gonna really help you to adjust and to help your child adjust. And things like your meal times are also gonna really help to set the body clock to local time. So eat at local time meal times, adjust to local time there and the bedtime routine and, and the bedtime of course. If jet lag is really bad, you might not actually find that you or your little one actually fall asleep when you would like to, but at least you're giving your body and your brain all the right signals by going through that routine. So at least try to give it those signals and try to get into the rhythm. It will come much quicker if you do that than if you just don't even bother because you think it's too hard. <laughs> so get into local time with your routine straight away. If you haven't changed time zones, then that piece isn't really that big of a deal, but you can of course still adopt your routine. So make sure that you are doing that bedtime that it's happening at the same time as it would in your normal home environment. When it comes to bedtime routines, some of you might be thinking, oh, but I don't want to put my child to bed when I do at home because we want to have evenings out together and family meals and so on. Well, that's fine. Do this at your own discrepancy in terms of your child's age and the knock-on effect. If you know that keeping your little one up extra late is going to mean it ruins the next few days, it's probably not worth it. But if you have a little one who's quite flexible and you know that they'll sleep in a bit later and it works for them, then fantastic. But with babies, there's no major need to change much at all because you can actually do the bedtime routine and then you can just settle them to sleep in the stroller or the pram. Put a nice blackout blind over the push chair like the snooze shade and then wheel them out for your evening meal. And, and you can park them up next to you whilst you enjoy a nice peaceful supper with your partner and little one just sleeps. So you can still send them all the signals of bedtime, go through their routine, have them washed and refreshed from the sweaty day maybe and fed and snuggle them up in the pram. And then when you get back to your accommodation later, you can simply transfer them from there to their sleep space for the night. So there are lots of ways that you can stick to that. And I remember doing this with my own little ones when they were both little. They were in a double push chair actually, and getting them all ready and snuggled up in the double and then wheeling them out um, fast asleep whilst we had a nice evening meal. So holiday rules can be holiday rules. And then when you get back home, you can get back to your home rules. And if you want to have a set routine for holiday and go like, well, whilst we're away, this is how we're going to do things. These are going to be our timings and it's a little bit different at home, then that's okay. But just make sure that when you go back home, switch back to your home rules. And when you have holiday rules, I would strongly recommend that you don't make the holiday rules so incredibly different like, for instance, if at home you never ever sleep in the same bed as your child, but then on holiday you do, that one might be something they're not willing to give back up when you get home. Now, it's one thing being in your room in their own sleep space on holiday in the same room, and then going back home and being back in their own room, that's much easier to transition. But because it's simply the room, you know, the environment, it's not so much you as an actual sleep onset association. If you become a sleep onset association whilst on holiday, then that's going to be a much tougher one to shift when you get back home. So holiday rules in terms of tweaking the routine, maybe that's cool, but try not to completely and utterly throw away all your usual boundaries. So the third piece I said I'd cover is the return. On your return home, when you get back home, it's like the reverse of when you get to the destination. So when you get home, switch back to your usual, your local time, if you did change time zones, switch back to your home rules and routine as quickly as possible. Just get back into exactly what you do at home. And the way you do it as well, how you do it. So rather than having days of it lagging over, days of slight shifts in routine or letting things like jet lag overtake you, try to just get back to the norm as swiftly as possible with all of that and your routine timings as well. So through the day, nap times, meal times, all of those things, just wanna go straight back to how you do things at home. If you see any resistance from your little one, because they've been on holiday and things have been a bit different and they start almost pushing or testing to see if they can carry on doing that now, that's where you have to show no chink in your armor, stick 
to the rules and just persist. And yes, they may dig their heels in and try because really they're just trying to say to you, but I was enjoying doing it this way. <laughs> and you just need to show them that, you know, now, no, now we're at home. This is how we do it. This is what we do at home and stick to it. Don't give in. Don't gray the lines with those rules and boundaries. Like I said, a few days of resistance, as long as you're completely solid in your response and you're consistent, they will switch back nice and quickly. So there you go. Tips for traveling. If you're taking a holiday or a vacation with your family, these are some key things to look out for on the journey, at the destination and on your return home. So I hope you found this episode helpful. If you did, please leave a comment. Tell us what you liked best or ask us if you have any other questions. We absolutely love to hear from you. And please also share this with a friend, tag a friend who you know could really use these tips this year. Until next time, take care, be happy, be healthy, and travel safely. Mm -hmm.